guess you can hear me. Um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is John Shaw. I am the Chief Operating Officer of VBRIC Systems. And um, I'm going to kick off the session today. This, the topic of the session is a how-to guide for online video marketing. Everything you want to know about how to use video streaming to advance your sales and marketing efforts. Um, really, there's three goals for the session today. Uh, number one, I wanted to give you some examples of how and why marketers are incorporating live and on-demand video to advance a variety of uh, sales and marketing objectives. I'm going to take those case examples and break that down into some you know, essential takeaways of how you put the pieces together to actually do similar types of uh, marketing and sales outreach programs. And then we're going to turn it over to my friend uh, Ishmael Syed, who's the chief architect of Aviva. And he's going to go through a very interesting case study, um, basically describing a three-year journey where they have deployed, in a very advanced way, streaming video technology, targeting 60,000 worldwide employees, and are now taking that same um, technology and platform and now directing it towards their 54 million customers. And uh, we'll, we'll be hearing from uh, Ish Ishmael on that. Okay, so uh, just uh, one slide on VBRIC. Uh, those of you that uh, aren't familiar with the company, we've been around for about 14 years. Uh, we provide streaming video products and services to corporate, education, and government customers. Um, we provide a platform that's both used within a corporate or educational government environment to be able to stream video over the local area network or wide area network. So within the corporate firewall, behind the corporate firewall, we also have an online video platform called VBOSS for streaming over the public internet. And these are examples in this slide of VBRIC customers that are using the technology specifically for marketing purposes. And you get some sense of the volume of assets that are being moved on a monthly basis in order to promote their message. <coughs> uh, by the way, please uh, feel free to ask any questions that you might have during the presentation. We'll also have a, about five or ten minutes at the end of the session for you to do so as well. Okay, so when we look at all those customers and all that video being moved around, really breaks down into six primary ways that folks are incorporating streaming video into their marketing programs. Um, they're posting video content on their customer-facing websites. They're building communities by motivating user-contributed content. Um, they're broadcasting sales and marketing events, both live broadcast and then providing them on an on-demand basis. They're using video, streaming video, to train their distribution channels to be able to have them represent them in the marketplace. Um, they're getting, if I'm a government customer, for example, they're using um, video to reach out to their constituencies and, and to get the message out to the community. And finally, uh, lots of folks using digital signage to promote their products and services. So what I'm going to do is now is kind of give you some examples of each of these six areas. Before I do that, a quick uh, a view of a Gartner study that was done about a year ago now. And what Gartner did is did a very extensive analysis of a broad range of enterprise class customers and looked at their use of streaming video for a variety of purposes. So on the vertical axis, you see the types of applications that they're using streaming video for. The dark blue represents the level of penetration that existed at the time of the study and the light blue was the projection by the year 2012, what would be the advancement in terms of percentage use of, straight, of video for these applications. So the three areas that really relate to sales and marketing are in what I just described in those six areas are training. Now this obviously refers to both internal training but also external outreach. Um, the communications of a corporate messaging, a corporate message and bringing that to my customers, my partners, my shareholders, and lastly, uh, digital signage. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is you already have quite significant percentage of these enterprise customers starting to adopt video technology, streaming video, in order to um, enhance their sales and marketing campaigns. If, if 
Many of you are like our customers. What they've found is that the traditional sales and marketing approaches in the marketplace are becoming less and less effective, and they're all looking for new ways in which they can tap into social media, viral marketing campaigns, uh, lots of ways, and many of them point towards uh, incorporating a visual element and a video element into those types of campaigns. And Gartner is uh, validating that. All right, so let's jump into the first example that I pointed to, uh, which is essentially a common across all of our customers that are using video within a marketing context. And that is posting video on their website with the motivation to improve the, the, the percentage of click-through for folks visiting the website and then acting on the content. Invariably, what that our customers find, the more video that they, and they post, and obviously relevant video, the more effective click-throughs they're getting. The example here is a newspaper called The Weekly Standard. They were trying to convert their print subscribers to also be digital subscribers. They did extensive email marketing. And, and they did an A-B test where they did uh, certain emails without video content and, other, and landing page without video content and then a landing page with video content. And what they found is that video, uh, the video enabled landing pages converted at, at over twice the rate of their other web pages. And this is just one example of, of many, many instances where we find similar types of results. So what are some of the now takeaways from uh, the, how folks are are using uh, video-based platforms to enable that kind of uh, website video. So one is, um, in a, and I'll just give a various prescriptives here, prescriptions here, one of the key things is to look for some very easy to use tools to create content and then upload that content on your site. Um, so uh, lots of questions that our customers ask us about what, what how do I, enable compelling content easily? How do I a, a equip not just the video professionals in my organization, but the, uh, the broader marketing community and even, even other training folks or product folks that want to create this kind of content? When you create that content, you want to be able to automatically trans have it automatically transcoded, which means converted into multiple video formats. So your customers, when they come to your website, want to be able to view that content from their PCs, from mobile devices, um, any, any device capable of rendering video. And you can't predict who those customers might be. So you, you, what you need to be able to do is take that video that you've created, upload it to your provider, and then have them transcode that into multiple formats and be ready to do that. You would then apply what's called smart tagging. Smart tagging is a way to, for that platform to recognize your hosted provider to recognize what's the device that's looking for that content and send to it the appropriate stream and make sure that it's the right stream, be it an iOS device, it might be a flash device, it could be some legacy um, device as well. And finally, you obviously want to be able to customize the players that sit on your website so that they look exactly, have the same corporate look and feel as the rest of your site. Okay. The other um, motivation for posting video content on your website is to improve your SEO results, search engine optimization. Uh, a, an example of this is a company we do business with called Design World. They have a library of well over a thousand videos. They also embed video in a lot of their articles and what they have found by using video SEO, SEO tools, uh, they have successfully brought their ranking from you know, many, many pages back in the organic search results to literally the number one search result in their product category. And, and they did that almost entirely through video. So why is that the case? Well, Forrester did a recent study that found that video-enabled web pages are 53 times more likely to get you on that front page than other types of content. That's, that's pretty amazing. <clears throat> So when you're looking at enab ena video enabling your marketing campaigns, you want to use tools that do what's called automated indexing of your videos, and not just by Google, but by for other organic search engines. It creates what's called a video sitemap, which then Google can use to index all the video content within that video and, and videos overall. Typically, you start seeing results within 10 to 14 days. 
and you'll, you'll very likely start seeing uh, increased customer conversions as a result. Okay? Secondly, uh, folks are using video streaming and user contributed uh, video content to create communities of interest around their particular products and services. So I'm giving you four examples of how some of our customers are doing that. Uh, dogchannel.com is uh, a site dedicated to pet lovers. Um, they, were, they were trying to get their, their users to upload examples of, of their pets and, vid and video of their pets, and you can imagine how much of that exists out there. And they then created a virtual currency which motivated a 10 times increase in the uploading of video from their, their, uh, their subscribers. And they now have, if you go on that site, just a huge library of uh, pet videos, of dog, dog videos. Military.com is the largest website in the world dedicated to enabling military families to communicate with each other and share information. And they found that by enabling video in their web campaigns, in their email campaigns, that while that was only one piece of the email campaign, it generated 80% of the click-through results for that email letter. And it, it was so much that they actually started in the actual email heading, referencing the fact there was a video that you've got to see here, and and because they were getting so many results from that that type of uh, vehicle. Progress Software using vid vid video to display customer te customer contributed video testimonials, and um, I'd suggest you check out a site called Virtual Tourist. This is the largest source of user generated travel content in the world, uh, much of which is is video oriented. So I think four great examples of folks saying, how do I create a buzz around what I'm doing and how do I create these forums and communities that start using my products and services? Another way to create this kind of harness user contributed uh, content and create a viral marketing campaign. This is an example of uh, McDonald's in Australia uh, that we're working with who created a campaign asking their customers over the age of 14 to submit videos showing their reaction to the first bite of the chicken McWing. You can imagine how exciting that is. And uh, they get a $5,000 prize uh, for uh, whoever is selected as the best video. And they've had just overwhelming results for this campaign. So some takeaways here in, in looking to try to uh, adopt this kind of strategy. One is you need to be, uh, make sure you're, you can accept protocol agnostic content, or you need to be protocol agnostic as it pertains to the content, and accept video content created in video various formats and by a range of devices. You can't tell your users which kind of content they want to contribute. Um, and then you want to take that content and create community building features. You want to enable that your, your viewers to send that content to a friend and um, via email. Hey, check this out. You want to be able to have them post that to social networking sites. You want to be able to take the embed code and actually drop that into their own site or to subscribe to some customized RSS feeds that you're, you're, you're providing. So these are all examples of how I'm taking um, what is just a, web, a set of videos on a website and now I'm trying to create the multiplier effect of people using these various tools to now amplify your message. The third type of uh, campaign is a broadcast, a webcast uh, of a sales and marketing event. Two examples here. Um, the Kauffman Foundation, a very large philanthropic organization, you may have heard of them. They are the leaders in entrepreneurial studies, inspiring our youth to uh, become entrepreneurs. And they hold live videos with really world leaders in industry, politicians, scientists, talking about how they uh, were able to uh, start a business or do something innovative. And so these are all live broadcasts. They do this around the world and um, have been very successful. Uh, another customer of ours, Trader Outlook, every day at 9 o'clock, they broadcast to their, a forum of um, day traders, essentially. And so they've got thousands of day traders that sign on in the morning in this webcast and get a daily update of stock market trends, recommendations, basic coaching that they provide and pay for. They used to do this only via audio, but they found that now being able to do that in a, in a visual way was much more effective. So what are some takeaways from this? Uh, one, uh, everything we've talked up until this point has been about on-demand content. 
you also want to be able to support live content. Even if you're not prepared yet to go live, eventually uh, all of our customers to start on demand eventually start thinking about, hey, I want to do some live broadcast and then repopulate that content on demand for later use. You want to be able to engage with your audience with interactivity features like chat and polling. And it's very important that you intelligently manage content on your site. So you're creating this library of content over time. How do you manage that library? And you need to be able to categorize the content, have meta metadata within that content that lets folks discover the relevant content to, that they, they're looking for. And you, you need to be able to expire content uh, so that you don't have a lot of dated material on your site. Okay? These are just three examples how you may want to manage content. I'm happy, by the way, to, to send this presentation to anyone that uh, would be interested. Uh, I, I can see folks taking some notes here. Um, fourth area is training distribution channels. This is a very common way that people are using this kind of technology. Uh, you know, go figure. Sutfen, the world's largest fire engine manufacturer, uh, has been using uh, the VBRIC for several years to syndicate video-based training content to their network of worldwide dealers. And I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by syndication on the next slide. They used to do this via DVD distribution. And um, they found that uh, video broadcasts were much more effective. And CarQuest is an auto parts company. They have a weekly 20-minute uh, video broadcast to 18,000 of their partners in 3,400 3, locations around uh, North America. Uh, and they've been doing this for close to three, four years now. So what are the, some of the key takeaways? Well now, this content's a little different than trying to create an, a viral type of environment where I want every single person who possibly can look at this content to get it. I want to syndicate this content, meaning I want to control on the sites on which you can view that content, and I want to know who exactly I have access to this content. I don't want all my competitors to be able to get in there and start seeing my training materials. So I need to have some level of password protection and something called domain lock, meaning I can ensure that no one can take your embed code and then be able to populate that in other sites that you may not want that content to reside, okay? Fifth area is reaching out to the community, very relevant if you're in social services, nonprofits, healthcare, government. How do I get my message out to uh, my, uh, my partner, my user base? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uses the technology to distribute new policy changes uh, to their, their clientele. And then they analyze geographic viewing statistics and then able to target specialized outreach pro programs based on those viewing statistics. And Barack Obama uh, was a good customer of ours during his presidential campaign. Uh, got a lot of press for, you, for the, his successful use of this kind of technology to build enthusiasm for his campaign, but also as a fundraising vehicle. So some takeaways here, you want to be able to simultaneously uh, broadcast content, not only to, your, uh, to uh, your customers and partners, but also internally. Often when you start looking at this kind of content, I may want to do, I'm doing a policy update. I also want to communicate that to my employees. So how do I communicate simultaneously to both audiences? Uh, I want to be able to have controlled posting to social media sites to have content approval workflows to, so that I know what content's going where, and then capture lots of data metrics. So I want real-time reporting on what's happening at the time of the broadcast. I want to know exactly who my audience was, how many prior and new viewers, where were they coming from, and so on. And then I want to understand what content is most popular. If they dropped off, when did they drop off? Why did they drop off? This is the kind of data you need to be able to tailor your content well. And finally, um, there are a very common way that, that streaming video is used in sales and marketing programs is digital signage. This is just one example of many. Uh, we recently, about a year ago, deployed 150 digital signs in the Washington Convention Center, which is the second largest building in Washington. It just opened a year ago. They're holding hundreds of annual events and conferences. And what they do is provide real-time event updates. These are actually contributed by the exhibitors. Uh, and then the attendees can buy, provide feedback via Twitter directly through the kiosk or the, this digital sign that they're getting. So wrapping up, uh, VBRIC uh, 
obviously is in this business. There are others in the business as well. This is, this is a, a, a visual representation of the VBRIC. It's called the VBRIC online streaming service platform that does a number of things that I've described and happy to talk to you if uh, you're interested in learning more about that. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Ishmael. Careful, because you're not having a good day, are you? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, John. So um, my background is I'm an independent consultant in the visual collaboration and video space and have been for many years. And my most recent engagement began about over three and a half years ago with Aviva, um, which is quite well known in the UK. We used to be Norwich Union. Uh, it's the world's fifth largest insurance company, over 50,000 employees and about 55 million customers. Um, we're, we're right the way across the globe and we, everything we produce tends to have, to have to be in about 17 different languages. Um, so I'll quickly bring up, I haven't got a lot of slides, you'll be glad to know. Um, there we go. So our engagement was actually, is that you? Sorry, wrong one. Um, was actually the other way round. Now what I mean by that is most large enterprise, um, enterprise environments tend to focus on being able to reach out to their customers with video and try out different techniques and technologies and methodologies and see what works. Uh, for us, we are an insurance company, and you've got to bear that in mind as we go through what we've done. So we are a financial organization. We, we provide insurance services to a global um, operation. So very different context than if you were McDonald's or you're producing uh, toys for kids in terms of what kind of engagement you can have with your customer base. So what I meant by we do it the other way around is the first focus for the company was actually to engage with the staff and not the end customers. So how do we increase productivity? How do we engage with our um, existing staff around the world? How do we unify what is effectively 40 autonomous businesses as one company? Hence the name Aviva is only about three and a half, four years old. Before that, it was 40 different company names. So effectively, that was our base. It was 60,000 staff. The challenge was to become one company. The challenge was to unify the brand internally. The challenge was to then make it a, a conform to a set of policies that everybody was going to adhere to and really get people collaborating with each other so that people from Singapore would start to utilize uh, some of the skills of employees in the UK as opposed to traditionally Singapore would go out and look for additional resources and hire staff uh, on a temporary basis from Singapore. So really utilizing the talents where possible. Um, so we started on a roadmap. It's, we're not interested in each of these. I just wanted to show you the, the scale of what we were doing. So we wanted to build a global intranet. We didn't have one before. We wanted to have everyone have video conferencing capabilities. So we built that out and gave 60,000 um, HD webcams, uh, one, seven, a 720p webcam to everybody with a headset, gave them the tools to be able to connect in a video conference between any employee at any time uh, from anywhere. So you can be over the internet or you can be internally on the premises with any laptop. Even if you haven't got your corporate laptop with you, you could be in a cyber cafe and get access to these services. We had to make sure that the network was going to be optimized to be able to carry all this rich media uh, um, as opposed to just traditionally email and financial applications being used. And that wasn't just a case of buying bigger pipes. We used some very clever innovative software that you can, if you do some research, you can, you can embed into your existing networks to optimize. Um, and then lastly, and this is the bit that's obviously relevant for, for this session, is we built out Aviva TV. The ability to deliver live broadcasts in HD and on-demand videos to distribute to our existing 60,000 employees, irrespective of which country, what language, or location, or laptop they happen to be consuming the content on, or an iPad or an iOS device. Uh, and that was the focus. Now, the reason we were building Aviva TV was also subtly different to some other enterprises that I'd spoken to prior to designing this system, and that was it wasn't about getting the CEO's headshot, shoulder uh, shot of him, him or her talking about uh, the financial results for the year. One or two videos produced annually that everybody's forced to watch. Um, but also, we didn't want to go down the complete opposite route, which is user-generated content. Anybody and everybody producing content internally about any topic and just putting it onto the system. So it was somewhere in the middle. We wanted to empower the individuals to be able to produce content that was appropriate, either down to their team level or down to the group or even the business unit or regional level and then be able to track and monitor who's watching it and what the purpose is, controlling it in case it's the financial traders in Aviva Investors, talking about specific Forex movements, so they, own, they want to be able to control um, who gets to see those. Uh, and, and that's the kind of mix that we wanted to achieve. So we went on to build Aviva TV with the help of very carefully selected vendors who were, I'd like to choose my words carefully, but at the right element of the roadmap to support us in this. An example would be VBRIC, uh, who played a key role in this. Microsoft played a key role in this, and Polycom. Um, 
because the existing technologies just weren't up to scratch. We don't want to spend humongous amounts of money on bandwidth. We don't want to have to upgrade everybody's computers to the latest Dell or HP laptops. We want to be able to allow 720p video to be able to play on older laptops. Um, so we worked with a whole bunch of vendors and be able to create the technology. It got launched this year, so three years later, serving 50,000 global users. Remember, these are internal staff. They can access it internally or over the internet. Um, we can deliver on-demand videos, live broadcasts, uh, with, with a little bit of a delay, but, not, uh, but, but the delay isn't a, a big deal for us. I mean, 20-second delay is, is nothing. Uh, but we were able to squeeze the delay down to about five seconds if we were delivering financial uh, news straight off the, uh, straight off the air. Content production, so anybody everywhere around Aviva was able to understand what cameras they ought to buy and what's, and this is the other bit, is how do they produce content? So a lot of videos don't look very nice because you've given an employee a camera and just told them to shoot something. So giving them a bit of training on framing, composition, perspective, not having a pot plant behind them and having the sun shining through the window made a huge difference to our, uh, to our consumption numbers of, people's, uh, of our staff's video. Being able to play on just about any device, making sure that people provide details on who they are before they watch it, so that certain videos are only watchable by the employees and depending on what type of employee, employee they are. So we authenticating them, authorizing that they have the right permission to consume content. Um, and as John said, making cert certain, certain videos um, have an end of life so that they can't be consumed after a date. More importantly, they can't be consumed before a certain date, before our financial results come out. Um, efficient delivery so that we don't bring down the global network. Interestingly, over the three and a half years, we had nobody in the global network services team become a barrier to us being able to deliver this, which is quite uncommon. Normally, you have to get over those network teams. And that was because of the, the way in which we were using smooth stream packet-based HTTP delivery of the video. We are a huge SharePoint uh, site, so I don't know how many of you know what SharePoint is, but it's, a, it's an internal enterprise content management system. 89% uh, of the enterprise market globally uses SharePoint, so it's a huge market share. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that people weren't going off to a separate website to watch videos from the one that they traditionally use for all their day-to-day -day work. And digital rights management for encryption, we had a whole bunch of requirements. Um, so, and I'll get, and you'll see how this fits into our 53 million customers, because it sounds like everything we did was meant for the internal staff base, uh, but that was our original focus. So we built out a solution by using in inventory of the assets that we've already got, and I won't bore you with the technical elements, but again, I'd be happy to share the slides with you, but we chose the Microsoft platform as the underlying delivery technology. Um, we chose H.264 codec because we knew that as we went it out to the larger audience, um, it would be device agnostic and it's a standards, standards based codec. We chose the smooth streaming wrapper with an Apple wrapper for delivery to the iOS devices. We bought a, a beautiful silver light based player that was deployed into SharePoint. Uh, and that's when we started to get really clever because we were using silver light. We could do all sorts of fun stuff, which you'll see in a second. Um, 16 by 9, 720p HD are standards. So we don't produce standard definition content unless it's really, really important to produce it in standard def. And that would only be because that business unit doesn't have the HD tech, uh, camera e equipment. Um, so it's unlikely we would use standard def. Automatic bitrate switching. This was great because it meant that irrespective of whether the network was able to give you 3 megabit HD or whether you were able to get the network delivery but your laptop's performance just couldn't handle rendering that image or you were just watching the video in a small screen size. Those are, all, those are three very important reasons to drop the bitrate and give somebody a smaller stream than giving them the maximum that you've got available. So we've got different stream rates coming out for the same video and the technology then adapts itself according to those three, uh, those three uh, factors. Uh, which meant that there was no exclusion. Everybody was included, everybody was able to watch it irrespective of where they were. We multicast live, live content out so we can have up to 60,000. We've had 60,000 people watching the content in HD across our estate and over the internet. Uh, and then we provided all the help and training for people to be able to produce good, uh, good, good quality videos with the right equipment they need. We provided subtitles, automatic subtitle detection. If you're connected into our SharePoint site, well, I already know about 35 different things about you uh, because you filled in your profile. I know where you are. We know your mother tongue. We know what other languages you speak. We know your preferences. We know your browser version. So therefore, a user shouldn't have to go and choose a subtitle. They should be able to have that automatically detect it. Um, also, if you've got multiple audio streams in foreign languages, being able to detect those and play it on start. Uh, so that's the, through the user profile detection. And then being able to report back on how many videos got watched, what length, what bit did they stop at, what bit did they skip forward and rewind on, um, has proved invaluable to us. 
So that's effectively what it ends up looking like, which doesn't look you know, any, anything different to what you may have seen before, but if you just cast your mind in the fact that we're talking about 60,000 employees potentially watching an on-demand video from locations that I have no understanding of or, or prior knowledge of, um, potentially 7,500 of those people in, in a couple of buildings right next to each other where you think that the network would get really, um, would get pr fairly tight. So if I just come out of this for a second and see if it will work here. I don't know if it will. Right, this is the live, this is actually connected into the ship at the Aviva World site, so I provided my username and password. This is not meant for c the 55 million customers. This is meant for the employees. I've managed to come in and I've knocked up a couple of movie trailers and put them at the server end, so which, is in, which is in central London. Um, and if I hit play, I think that should start playing. There we go, it plays. So, so what it shows is that nobody really realizes they're not in, that the video is coming from a totally different location. They're inside a SharePoint page. They didn't get asked any other weird questions of do you, do you want to log in again or not. Um, it's playing. It's fairly seamless. I'll go turn the volume down before this disrupts the rest of the sessions going on in the other rooms. Um, it's playing in a particular window size, so I'm not sending three megabit worth of, um, of HD. I'm, only, I'm sending a much lower bit rate, and we can see that here. We're actually playing 900K at the moment, based upon the network connection I've got, the laptop's ability, and the screen size. If I then blast that full screen, in theory, the, it sense checks, the green flies up to the top and says, hey, this laptop should really be pulling about 3 meg instead of 900K. The red line says, I've already pulled a bunch of 900K. I think I'll stay on that bit right until I've finished it. I've emptied my laptop out. And as soon as the laptop's buffer runs out, that red will then jump up to the 3 meg, and then it will switch to effectively a much higher um, HD stream, assuming we can get 3 meg uh, in the location that we're at. We'll see whether that happens or not. Now, the users don't care. The network suddenly gets contended, the bit rates switch, nobody ever has the buffering symbol, nobody has the stuttering movements, the frame rate up at the top tells us I'm getting 25 frames a second. You'll see that it's jumped up to 1.8. Now, it could have gone to 3 meg, but it didn't uh, because of the network contention. So, and then if I jump, to another location, there is no little wheel that buffers, right? So you can jump fast forward and rewind um, at any rate that you want to, and users just don't experience um, any issues. And then we built simple things into the app, into the player, like a playlist. Allows you to jump between section one, section two, section three, section four. Um, and, and users are placing these themselves, the player widget, onto pages themselves, populating it with videos themselves, um, and, then, and, and that's it, and they just let it go, and people are able to kind of watch what they want, irrespective of where they are. So we realize if we're now going to go out to the customer base, we've, we understand the technology. If you can get technology like this, if you can get video working inside an enterprise, which has far more constraints than externally, um, you want to pretty much a winner when you go out to the, the larger market. Sometimes you get arguments from people saying, are you sure that's true? Well, if you're going to serve 50 million, or the Beijing Olympics, for example, if you're going to serve 30 million consumers, it's likely those 30 million consumers have got an internet connection each. You try serving video to five and a half or six or 7,000 people who are in the same building with the same pipe. Um, it's, it's a very different kettle of fish. So the last bit that we had to think about was, okay, if we're now gonna go out and potentially offer people the ability to engage with our end customers, what are they likely to look like? What are these customers? Are they people who hold insurance policies? Are they our huge network of brokers who resell our insurance policies? Is it additional investors out there who are looking for information from our traders that need um, fairly quick information so they can make their trades, as we saw in one of the examples of uh, what Vbrick's other customers? What tools can we give them? If we don't provide them with alternative tools, what you've got is a bunch of people with webcams. And if you look at an enormous amount of online video today, it is a webcam or a camera facing somebody with sunlight coming out through the window. Um, and how do they ingest additional data, financial data, Bloomberg tickers, what, what about um, uh, dynamic data that's changing? So what we did was we built a couple of tools. I'll, I'll talk through this one as opposed, to, um, as opposed to play the actual audio. Don't laugh. It's, it's, it, it was a prototype that we did to prove to the exec team that it's possible. And then, then it took off as a concept for training, for education, for engaging with brokers. Um, and you'll see what I mean. We wanted to present the opportunity for people to be able to literally take a piece of green cloth anywhere in the, in the world, 20 square foot of office space, direct a normal camera at the, at the green screen and have somebody stand there and talk with a, this guy talks a lot, he really does, uh, uh, with a little headset on so you can pick up the audio, and then be able to in real time take, as you'd expect from a green screen, is then composite that in real time, in real time, this is live shoot, this is nothing's been, ed I've edited it down so that it's down to three minutes to make sense. Um, 
automatically put an overlay of text on top, okay, fair enough, uh, with some clever software. The guy's turning to his right, there is nothing to his right except a, a, a coat hanger, but you've got this virtual screen, you can then bring in um, a PowerPoint slide or an animation or a trading application or a financials or slides of the, of, of, uh, of the financial results, queue up a ready-made video that somebody's created of where Aviva's, um, um, sorry, charitable money that we all raise is going. So there's an example of where some of our money's being spent. So you can queue up a video that's on demand and play it into the live broadcast. By the time you've come out, I've grabbed a little office chair, chucked it onto the green screen, sat down. So those pictures in the background are taken from my iPhone upstairs on the 23rd floor. Um, none of this exists, none of the desk, none of the monitor, none of the windows, nothing actually exists. It's all completely fake. Is that me or you or who? I think that might still be me. Is that next door? I'm not sure who's playing movie trailers. No, it's not me. I think it is me. It is outside, isn't it? Is it coming from my laptop? Because the chances of that, of somebody else having a trailer playing at the same time that I've got is it is God. I was about to shout at conference room one. I'm sure you prefer that trailer rather than the video I'm showing you at the moment. Uh, sorry, yeah, the point being that this guy I'm interviewing at the moment is coming from the United States. It's too expensive to fly that person over, and therefore, normally when you want to have senior execs or senior directors be able to join you on engaging with your end customers, you have to wait four months to be able to get that time slot where you can get him or her to fly over and join you in the studio. We don't want that. We want the democratization of production technology to get videos out really quickly that don't look like a pot plant in the back. So we used video conferencing, we could use Skype or anything else, take the video stream from Skype, change it slightly, and feed it into the mixer that's now appearing. Unlike Sky News or any of these BBC News channels, when the presenter turns around and says, is the Libyan correspondent available? Let's hear from him or her. You normally get this five or six second delay, don't you, by the time the question gets there and then the answer comes back again. So we don't have that. It's actually in real time. So the, the video conferencing takes care of the conversation between the two people in real time, and then the, the actual streaming technology composites it all and pulls it out. So he's having a conversation. Uh, you're able to go full screen with this in a second, as you'll see. So we're taking him from a webcam. All he's got is a Microsoft webcam that costs 20 pounds, uh, which looked fairly good in, in 720p. You're able to do it with alternative people from Italy, for example, and then we're able to join the three of them together, all three of us together, so having a three-way conversation and having a debate about something in particular, maybe the way that the Dow Jones is gonna move or the FTSE 100's moving. And then once we've had a chat, we're able to draw information directly out of our financial systems and display them in 3D, uh, th sorry, in a, in a 3D perspective inside a virtual space that doesn't exist. And then the last bit with, that we did was, do you remember the SharePoint page I showed you where you watch the player? We included a little bar at the bottom that, that said feedback. And anybody who's watching this live, video, live stream can then type in a message. And rather than it just appearing as part of a wiki or, or, a, or a, a poll, we're rendering that text as a video overlay into the actual video, if that kind of makes sense to you. So it's, it's part of the video and it's coming in and the time is about a second and a half between a viewer in Singapore typing in something in and it appearing in. So you can see that you could be bringing in financial data, you could be bringing in uh, Twitter feeds in here, you could bring in an RSS feed in here. Some people did say that actually it's one of the challenges they saw in doing it this way is that forever the video has now got that text embedded inside it. So it, uh, it's, it's sometimes a challenge if you want the video to stay kind of up to date, you don't want the video overlaid. So as I said to you earlier, it was, um, it was done in Silverlight. So if you're using Silverlight as, a, as an application layer, you can build it, build the player so that the RSS feeds come in and are displayed on top of the video, not part of the video. So then when you separate the video away and you wanna reuse it again in the future, um, you're, able to do, you're able to keep the, the text away. So that's effectively what we did. That's now launched, that's live across the entire 60,000 user base. It goes out to our joint ventures, um, and now it's gonna be going out to our broker market, and then we don't know what weird and wonderful ways in which people are now going to be changing the way they produce video. They just don't need to care about how it's gonna reach the end user. That's it, that's us done. Thank you. Oh, sorry, we've got questions, but. Yeah, so we don't store any of the video in SharePoint. So that SharePoint experience that you just watched a moment ago gives you the perception that everything's coming from SharePoint. The only thing that came from SharePoint was the outer pages, the physical player, and that's it. The physical player then says, right, I need some video. I'm now gonna go off and detect 
where that person is, what the language, the mother tongue, and, and all that kind of fun stuff, and then goes off to the nearest location and picks off the right content with the right bitrate. None of the video is actually stored inside SharePoint. The metadata, the meta tagging, and the reporting, we feed back through XML into SharePoint, so the reporting and, and data store, but the videos themselves are stored on origin servers and distributed servers uh, around the enterprise and on the internet. Uh, and yes, they're encrypted in the storage, and then they're SSL delivered, so the delivery is SSL encrypted as well. Yeah, and then DRM, if you really want to be picky, because the financial results, for example, is DRM those. So that if it got bit cached on the person's laptop and their laptop got stolen, the, the, lo the actual storage there is DRM'd, so you couldn't play back the cached content. Yeah. Hello. What sort of budget am I looking at? Uh, yeah. So, so just the TV bit, I guess, not all the other stuff. Oh, I'll, I'll, we'll just do the end bit then. <laughs> so the TV bit we did um, from start to finish in terms of timing was four and a half months, five months. Um, but as with most projects, if you've had a year before then working on a totally different project, but knowing you're going to do video in a year's time, your brain and your team's already working on uh, working on the stuff as opposed to receiving the requirements on day one. Um, it's very different. So that was the end-to-end -end build out. Uh, and the budget was around... Uh, in terms of deployment, infrastructure, cost, program managers, project managers, governance, and all the stuff that's non-technical included was around, I think it was about 800,000 pounds. Yeah, around that. It's difficult to separate the technology and the project managers. The challenge with doing that, I think it's something I, or I ought to do, is that the project management element is the bit that's all, it, it has no ceiling. It can go on forever if your governance model and your ability to, and your agility isn't there to deliver, whereas the technology tends to just stay the same. Um, and we used existing assets where possible. We would go off and buy everything brand new and from the first vendor that came along. So it was, um, it was a challenge to get the requirements. When we first started our list of requirements, they were huge. And we spoke to alternative enterprises of our size to say, how many requirements have you got? And a lot of them just had, we just want video on our site. And we thought either we're doing something wrong or maybe we're you know, being too picky about the requirements. But I'm glad we did because when we spoke to the vendors and engaged with them, we were able to say, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And if you can't, have you got it on your roadmap? If it's not on your roadmap, what would it take to convince you to build it? Um, even Microsoft, for example, didn't have this ready. We had to work with the teams in Seattle, um, work with the development teams at Vbrick. Their hardware encoders had a roadmap, and they were willing to just squash the roadmap right up and, and bring our requirements forward. One last piece I might just share with you. I don't know how many enterprise customers there are here. What you'll find is if you're a, if you're a large corporate, um, many other vendors and, and, and large uh, large very large technology providers tend to want to serve the broadcast industry more than the enterprise industry first, because that's really where the bread and butter comes from. So that was one of the other challenges we had, is that we would have to wait a year to get the technology we wanted. It was on their roadmap, but way, way later. And if the broadcast industry said they want a slightly different reporting tool, they got it within a week. Um, so it was kind of breaking the mold and saying, we do exist as enterprises, and we are important. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.